can do it in half an hour. Okay, خلاص, yeah. No problem. When, when should I start? Okay. Just give me one sec. I will, I will, yeah, I'm going to get into line, I'm going to get into the screen. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد today إن شاء الله تعالى we're going to speak about a illustrious imam of Islam an illustrious Imam of Al-Islam, and his name is Imam al-Shafi'i, as you all know. And Imam al-Shafi'i is a great scholar of this religion. So what do we know about Imam al-Shafi'i, and what can we extrapolate from the life of this great Imam, Imam al-Shafi'i? Um, who was Imam al-Shafi'i? Where was he born? Imam al-Shafi'i, most reports indicate that Imam al-Shafi'i was born in Gaza, Gaza right now, Gaza, in Asham, or in today, what they call Philistine, in the year uh, 150 after the Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Imam al-Shafi'i was born in the year 150, and that's the same year that Imam Abu Hanifa died. It's the year that Imam Abu Hanifa died. So this is the great Imam, Imam al-Shafi'i. Imam al-Shafi'i um, was an orphan. Uh, his father died when he was a young man. So his mother moved him to uh, Mecca. They went to Mecca when he was around 10 years old. Before that, they were moving around and they were very, very poor. So, in terms of his nasab, his lineage, he's Muhammad ibn Idris, ibn, ibn Abbas, ibn Uthman, ibn Shafi' al Qurashi, for short. So, he's, he's from Quraysh. He's from Quraysh. Okay? And he was an orphan, like I said, and he was very, very poor. Um, they were, as, some, يعني, as his biographer says about him, they were musharrada bi Philistine. They were like, um, a family of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that were musharrada, they were like um, a, a, a living in destitute in, in Philistine. Okay, so at the age of 10, his mother, wanting to preserve uh, the lineage of, 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 um, of him being from the household of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, moved the family to Mecca. They moved the family to Mecca. Okay, at that time when they got to Mecca, Imam Shafi'i started to memorize the Quran at a young age, and um, it was noticed from him, Imam Shafi'i. People started to notice how quickly he could memorize the Quran. He could memorize the Quran very quickly. People were surprised. Yani. He, people started to see the level of intelligence this man has. This man is very intelligent. He started to memorize the Quran very, very quickly okay not only did he start to memorize the quran 
he started to memorize a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So at that time, there was many ulama of hadith, writing books of hadith, writing asanid, and Imam Shafi'i could just memorize it, memorize it as isnad, and memorize it very, very quickly. Okay? So subhanAllah, at a very young age, um, it was seen, it was noticed from Imam Shafi'i that this young boy, he's very gifted and talented. He's a very talented young man. So they went and uh, 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 put him in a place where he could express that talent, memorizing the Quran and things like that. After that, his biographer says, ثُمَّ it, uh, uh, it says, وَقَدْ إِتَّجَهَ إِلَى التَّفَصُّحْ فِي الْعَرَبِيَّةِ Imam Shafi'i, after memorizing a hadith at a young age, memorizing the Quran, he decides to go and learn Al-Arabi Al-Fasih. He goes, to, he wants to learn um, classical, clear Arabic. So what does he do? He goes to the Hudayl tribe, the Hudayl tribe, on the outskirts of Mecca, around that area. Okay, Why did he do this? Somebody could ask, why does Imam Shafi'i want to learn? Um, why did he do this? Why did he go on a mission for, for uh, a tafassuh, trying to speak fasih clearly? The reason why Imam Shafi'i did that was because at this time, the Muslim Ummah is spreading everywhere. Sharqan wa gharban. Left, uh, east and west. Okay? The Muslim Ummah is spreading. And because of that, the Arabs are interacting with different people now. I'm talking about the original Arabs of the Arabian Peninsula, not people today. So when I say to you the Arabs, you have to remember the Arabs of that time. So the people of the Arabian Peninsula, Yemen, um, uh, uh, Najd, Hijaz, Bahrain, these areas, that, that, was, that was the Arabian Peninsula. And obviously, you know, what you call today Qatar and all these other places, Oman, but that was the Arabian Peninsula. People from that place, that was Jazeera al Arabiya. Nobody else before that, prior to Islam, spoke Arabic. It was only that, those people who spoke Arabic and a few people in Asham. Okay? So now that Al Islam is spreading, different people are speaking Arabic. So you have people from Egypt now speaking Arabic. People from Persia now learning and speaking Arabic because it was the official language of the Khilafa. So if you wanted to get anywhere in life, you had to speak Arabic. What was the result of that? The result of that was because people started to speak Arabic who didn't speak Arabic before, the language started to change. The language started to change, the speech pattern started to change, the grammar started to change. Do you kind of understand? I'll give you an example in English. In English now, most of us here, most of us here are ethnic minorities. As ethnic minorities, the way in which we speak English is different to people who are not, not, not non-ethnic minorities, but compare us to the Victorian era. The Victorian era, Queen Victoria, they spoke English, it was Fasih or Shakespeare's time. Now that different people are speaking the language, you're bringing words for your mother tongue, you're mixing it with a bit of English, you speak half English, half this language, half that language, just like that, people are doing that with Arabic. So people are having speaking Arabic and then mixing it with a bit of Persian, some people mixing it with some Coptic, other people mixing it with the Berber language, some people mixing it uh, with, with Spanish, because now um, the Islam has taken over Spain and here and there. So Arabic is becoming mixed. So now even the Arabs, they're speaking that mixed Arabic, okay? So for example, rather than saying in Arabic, ayyu shay'in, like what thing do you want? They'll say, ish, it changed. In a matter of a century, it just changed. Arabic, it just changed. So people are starting to speak like that. So yes, people can still speak fusha if they wanted to, but there were still tribes, there were still Bedouin tribes Okay, Bedouin tribes, meaning tribes that didn't live in the cities, they would, they would still speak the pure, uh, unadulterated Arabian Arabic. So, uh, uh, because a Shafi'i wanted to speak and wanted to understand knowledge and understand the Quran properly, he went to live with the Hudayl tribe, which was a tribe that spoke Arabic. And 
uh, uh, he went there to live with them, okay? He went there to live with them and to not spoil his tongue with slang words, okay? With slang. And he stayed with them for 10 years, okay? So he says about himself, Imam Shafi'i, he says about himself, Inni kharajtu an Makkah, falazamtu hudaylan. Indeed, I left Mecca and I stayed with the Hudayl tribe, Bil Badia, in the desert. Ata'allamu kalamuha wa kanat afsahu al Arab. I learned the way they spoke and they were the most, um, they were the most eloquent of all Arabs, okay? Falamma raja'atu anshudu al Ash'ar wa adhkuru al Adab wal Akhbar. When I left that tribe after 10 years, I could say the poetry, the old Arabian poetry. I could say it from memory. And I could read and I could say like their traditional stories in Fusha and the old Arabian tales. Now a person might be asking, why is this? Why would the person do this? Why would an alim do this? Why would the school of Islam do this? Why does he need to do this? The reason, and we're, it's, going to, we're, it's going to become clear later why Imam Shafi'i needs to do this. Imam Shafi'i has to do this because in order to understand the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that this Quran has been revealed bilisanin arabiyin mubin, in clear Arabic. And in order for you to understand it in clear Arabic, you need to understand, you need to know what clear Arabic is. And like I said to you before, Arabic, the prophetic Arabic that they used to speak in the time of the companions, uh, in the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is now slowly disappearing and being replaced with something else. So because of that, in order to understand the old Arabic, you need to be with the with the uh, people who still speak that classical Arabic. I'll give you an example. As-salah. As-salah, now if I say to you salah, everybody thinks of just praying five daily prayers. This is salah. But in the time of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated salah on the Muslims, in the Arabic language, if you said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you said to the companions as-salah, they would think you're saying dua. Because salah and dua are synonyms. Lafzani mutaradifan. They are synonyms. So the words changed when Islam brought, when Islam came, it changed the language of the people. And like I said, the Muslims started to spread around with other people and the language started to change. Another great, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 a scholar of the Arabic language known as Al Asma'i. He said, hearing about Shafi'i, he said, صححت أشعار الحذيل على فتن من قريش يقال له محمد بن إدريس. He said that there was a young man who corrected the poetry of the Hudayl tribe and he was Muhammad ibn Idris, Imam al-Shafi'i. So Imam al-Shafi'i, when living with this tribe for such a long time, and remember he's about, you know, this is from the, from the age 10 to 19, 20, about, eight, about 9, 10 years, he's with them. And at that time we said that he was so clever, so intelligent, so bright, okay? He ended up correcting the, uh, the, the, the poetry of this tribe. Imam Shafi'i now reaches the age of 1920 and he returns to Mecca, okay? Before that, when Imam Shafi'i was living with this tribe, he fell in love with two things. A rimaya, like, uh, you know, arrow shooting, like arrow shooting, archery. He, he, he fell in love with archery and he fell in love with ilm. These are the two things he, he loved, ilm and archery. So he now returns to Mecca, okay? And طلب العلم بمكة على من على من كان فيها من الفقهاء والمحدثين. He returns to Mecca and he starts to study with the scholars of Mecca from those fuqaha, those scholars of fiqh and the scholars of hadith. He studies with them and like I said to you before, he had already memorized a hadith. He had already memorized uh, 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 the Quran and now he knows. Arabic language to a, to a pristine to a pristine level to a you know to a really good sound level so he has an advantage above his peers his aqran so he starts to study with the ulama of 
Mecca. And one of the ulama of Mecca, Muslim ibn Khalid al-Zanji, he says to him, and uh, like we said, uh, uh, Imam Shafi'i is just a young man. He's only a young man. He says to him, يعني, Ifti ya Aba Abdullah, give fatawa, O Imam Shafi'i. فَقَدْ آنَ لَكَ أَن تُفْتِي The time for you to give fatwa has come. It's time for you to give fatwa. Give fatwa. You're already of a high level in knowledge. Give the fatwa. But Imam Shafi'i wasal talabahu lil'il. Imam Shafi'i carried on seeking knowledge. So he studied with the scholars of Mecca and he's been with the Hudayl tribe and he hears about another great alim. He's already taken in like a sponge everything that he could have had in Al Medina, I mean in Mecca, and he hears about a book. He hears about an Imam, he hears about a book. And the Imam that he hears about is a great Imam known as Imam Malik. And we know that Imam Malik was a student of Abu Hanifa. Okay? So, Afwan, we know that he benefited from Abu Hanifa, not a direct student. For Imam Malik, okay, he hears about Imam Malik and this great, this great book of his, Al Muatta, the great book Al Muatta. So Imam Shafi'i hears about this book, and we'll call him for now because he's not known as Imam Shafi'i yet. He's still a young man in his twenties. We'll call him Sheikh, okay, uh, Muhammad ibn Idris. Sheikh Muhammad ibn Idris, because we don't know him as Shafi'i now. He hasn't become Shafi'i yet. He takes, he finds someone in Mecca who has the book, and he says, "Give me the book. I want to read the book." He takes the book, he reads the book, and he's fascinated with the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's reading the hadith, and remember, the book Al Muatta is a collection of hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the actions of the Salaf of the Tabi'een and the other Sahaba and the people of Al Madina. So it has many other collections, okay? But majority of them are a hadith. So he takes it, he memorizes the asanid, he memorizes the hadith, and he says to himself, I have to go to Al Medina now. I need to go to Al Medina. So he goes to Al Medina, okay? He goes to Al Medina, and this, uh, uh, this journey to Al Medina is life changing for Imam Shafi'i. Imam's, Imam Shafi'i's life changes forever. Because at this point, Imam Shafi'i is studying hadith. And of course, يعني, he's, a, he's a scholar. But he's mainly studying hadith. And at this point, he goes and starts. Uh, uh, he, this, 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 this journey turns him to a d- direction that is needed. And this, this direction which, which had to happen was he turns from a hadith which he knew very well, but he goes into fiqh. He moves into the range of fiqh. And we'll come to understand why did Imam Shafi'i uh, turn to fiqh, okay? So he goes to fiqh. Now, he goes to al Madina and he arrives in al Madina. Imam Shafi'i, he arrives in al Madina. He arrives in uh, al Medina and he meets Imam Malik. He meets Imam Malik. Imam Shafi'i, now he's still maybe in his 20s, his mid-20s, possibly. Okay? And he meets, he meets Malik. Biographers say, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, this is tarikh, this is history, we don't know if it's true or not, but Imam Malik is said to have seen Imam Shafi'i and notices from him, he has farasa. Farasa is the is foresight, the ability to have foresight. So he looks at Imam Shafi'i and he's saying, okay, this young man, he's a clever young man. Okay, he's a very clever young man. So what does he say to him? He says, Ya Muhammad, ittaqillah. Oh Muhammad, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wajtanibil ma'asi. Stay away from sins. Fa'innahu sayakunu laka sha'an min sha'an. He said, O oh Shafi'i, O oh Muhammad, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from ma'asi because you're going to be something in the future. You are going to be something in the future. 
and this is the this is how a true alim is to his to his students. If you want to know how a scholar really acts with his students, let's look at the earliest scholars from Al Islam who who encouraged one another. So he saw the young man. I wasn't threatened by him. I didn't say, oh, he's going to take my position. He's going to take what I have. All of you are under me. You can only listen to me. You can't do X, Y, Z. No, he said, you're going to be something in the future. And that's the role of an alim. The alim, when he teaches the class, he should see those students who are doing very well and he should encourage them, go, go forward and, you know, uh, 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 go. You know, you've overgrown this class. You, you know, you, you've got enough for this class, go to other circles of knowledge, go to al Medina. go to this country, go to that country, go and learn and spread your wings. That's a true alim. The true scholar doesn't want to keep you underneath him. The true scholar wants you to flourish. So he sees this young sheikh, he sees this young man, Imam al-Shafi'i, and he notices immediately that this young man, he's something special. And you can always see it. And he also said, if you look at his words, he says, اجتنبل معاصي, okay, um, he said, stay away from uh, sins, فإنه سيكون لك شأن من, من شأن. You're going to become something in the future. Now, why is he telling him to leave sins? Because if, you, cause if he was, we're not saying Imam Shafi'i left sin, was sinning, but he's saying to him, try to be as God-fearing as you can, because inshallah you have a future. So your future in ilm, your future in knowledge, O oh, Imam Shafi'i, is directly linked with your taqwa. So anyone today who wants to seek ilm, all of us here, we need to try our best to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Okay, Imam uh, Malik says to him, okay, he says to him, إِذَا جَاءَ الْغَدْ تَجِي وَيَجِيءُ مَا يَقْرَأُ لَكَ He says, if you come tomorrow, come tomorrow and come with the thing that you're reading. أَإِذَا مُوَطَّ And what did we say? And what, what year was this? Okay, in fact, before we even get into that, he says that. Imam Shafi'i comes to Imam Malik the next day and they start reading al muwatta This book that took Imam Malik 40 years to write. Imam Malik notices something. And what did we say about Shafi'i? We said that Shafi'i lived with the Hudayl tribe for 10 years, 9 or 10 years, learning Arabic to a high level of proficiency. So what ends up happening? When he reads uh, uh, these ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's reading it so pristinely and the pronunciation is so exquisite, if you like, I don't think of another word, and was so pristine, it was so, Imam Shafi'i saying, Imam Malik saying, thinking, Subhanallah, this man, he's, he's, he's reciting the book better than me. And he, I wrote the book, but he's, he, he, he's not even making no grammatical error. He's not saying Muhammadun instead of Muhammadin. Everything is, he, it's, it, it, it's for, as you young shabab say, or as everyone says now, on point. And he's so much Allah. Okay, so he's reading it. So Imam, Imam, Imam Malik thinking, what is this? He, so it gets to a point where Imam Malik, he doesn't even want to teach the book, he just says to Mali, he just says to Shafi'i, read, just, just read the ahadith, it just sounds so, it's, يعني, it's, it's amazing, and they end up just reading the book in a few days, and, and, and it was, uh, the rest is history, love at, lo, not love at first sight, love at, love at first qira'ah or something, love at first reading, and salamu alaykum, uh, it, was a, it was a match made in heaven, as they say. So after that, after that, Imam Shafi'i studies with Imam Malik, until Imam Malik dies in the year 179 after the Hijrah. So we said that Imam Shafi'i was born in the year 150. Ten years later, he goes to study, he goes to live with the Hudayl tribe for ten years. So he comes back at the year 170, he's 20 years old. We then said he went to go and study with the scholars of Mecca, and then he goes to al Medina, and now... At the age of 29, Imam Malik dies, and Imam Shafi'i is 29 years old. Even though Imam Shafi'i, 
even though Imam Shafi'i, right, um, was 29 years old and stayed with Malik for a few years, learning ilm from him, taking the knowledge, okay, um, Imam, Imam Shafi'i would still have time to go around to different countries, you know, and visit other people, visit his mother, mother in Mecca, you know, serve her, go away, come back, then go back to Malik. It was a long process with his sheikh. So now, after Imam Malik dies, Imam Shafi'i is now 29. We said that he was born in a poor family. Even though he had lofty lineage, he was still a poor family. So what did he do? He ends up going uh, to, a, 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 to a town known as Najran. Najran still exists. It's in Saudi Arabia. It's as if a person, if you're in Mecca or you're driving towards Yemen, it's in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula. It's in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, and it's a place called Najran. He becomes a judge or like a minister. Not a minister, like he has an administrational role in Najran. Anyway, because of the political instability in, 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 in the whole ummah at the time, there was a lot of uh, uh, back and forth and, and a lot of يعني, internal disputing with, with emirs and different princes. Not princes, but يعني, different emirs and... Uh, chaos is starting to ensue. People start to accuse Imam Shafi'i of X, Y, Z in his role. And, you know, different factions of the family of the Prophet are saying this and that. Just, just a lot of يعني, internal يعني, issues are going on that people can read in, 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 in books of, uh, of books of tarikh, of history. But anyway, he ends up leaving. He ends up going. He ends up going to Baghdad again for a second time. He ends up going to Baghdad in the year 184. Okay, so this is five years after Imam Shafi'i has, has died. So Imam Shafi'i now, age 34, he leaves his job in Najran. He got some money from it. He had enough to, you know, to survive. And he says, Khalas, I'm going to go to Baghdad once again. And he goes to Baghdad and he benefits from the scholars of the Ahnaf. Because Imam Abu Hanifa was from, uh, was from Iraq. And the students of Imam Abu Hanifa were in Iraq. So Imam Shafi'i now, having studied in Mecca, having studied in al Medina, studied mostly fiqh, okay? I mean, studied mostly hadith. He now goes to Iraq once again and benefits from the fiqh of the people of Iraq, okay? And in this, this is where Imam Shafi'i truly becomes the Imam. Because what he does is, he goes to Al-Iraq, where the people of Iraq, they used fiqh and they used what is called a ra'i. A ra'i. A ra'i. So they would use analogy, meaning qiyas. So how, how can I explain this, basically? Basically, in, the, in, 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 in this time, in, you have several different madrasas, schools, happening in the Islamic ummah. In Mecca and Medina, or especially in Al-Medina, you have ulama of hadith. Ulama of Al Hadith. Okay? The biggest of them, Imam Malik. In Iraq, you have scholars of fiqh. Why was there more scholars in fiqh in Iraq than there were in, Mac in Medina? The reason why there was more scholars in Iraq of fiqh was because there were less companions and there were a lot of people who were fabricating a hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it would take a scholar a month or two to collect a hadith. So obtaining a hadith was very difficult. Therefore, the ulama of, 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 um, of Iraq would generally be very hesitant to accept a hadith in Iraq. Because of the fitna that took place in Iraq previously, because of the political instability in Iraq and because of the karwal uh, far going back and forth, political instability. So people could just make up a hadith just to gain power, for example. So the ulama of Iraq, they had a policy. At-tashaddud fi qabool al-hadith. We're not going to just accept any hadith because we don't know what this person is. Not only that, in Al-Iraq, there were many different Tawa'if. You had Shia, you had Batiniya, you had uh, Khawarij, you had everything in, in, in Iraq. Different uh, 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 so-called Muslims at the time. So therefore, the scholars of the Sunnah said, listen, we, it, we, it's very risky if we accept a hadith. 
In Medina, you had none of that. Most of the Sahabas, the major Sahabas, they became, they went to Asham. They went to, you know, what's the modern day Syria. They established their offices, their political offices there. Their madaris grew from there. So uh, there was a fitna in, 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 in Medina. Everyone just, you know, carried and, 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 and uh, 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 took knowledge generation after generation until we got to the time of Imam Malik. No one's lying. No one's inventing a hadith. There's no Shia and any of the, you don't have any of these problems. There's no philosophers, nothing like that. So a hadith, you can accept a hadith. So what the, the, the scholars of, 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 uh, of, of, of Iraq, who, where the Hanafis came from, what they did is, what they did is this. They did have a hadith. They didn't have as many ahadith as, 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 Mac, as Medina, but they still had ahadith. So what they did is, they ended up taking from the students of uh, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, the great Sahabi, and other companions, and they took those fatawa on all different topics, because the Sahabas left many fatawa. So they took those fatawa of the Sahabas, and when a new topic, a new issue would arise, rather than taking a hadith that they don't know sahih or not, they would go to these fatawa of the Sahaba and they would say, look, Ibn Umar did this, now somebody is asking us this question, we don't have a hadith, but let's use an analogy, let's think what would Ibn Umar do in this position based on what he did here, and that's why it's called Ahlul Ra'i. So they weren't just inventing something, they were using a, they were using fatawa from the Sahaba and making an analogy. So for example, let's say somebody wanted to inherit wealth or something, someone's parents died and there's a particular family situation. They don't have a direct hadith for it, so they'll go to a fatwa that maybe Ibn Mas'ud did, which was similar, and they'll say, okay, Ibn Mas'ud did this, we're going to do that. That's how the madhab arised. In Medina, like I said, that wasn't the case. But in that, in what the in what the um, in what the Ahnaf were doing, because of that thing that they were doing in getting the Safat out of the Sahaba, they became very, very strong in fiqh. Very strong in fiqh. So Imam Shafi'i, with his level of hadith, with his level of uh, uh, Arabic language, with his level of Quran, he goes there. And he starts to benefit from those hadith. I mean, he starts to benefit from those scholars of, of what do you call it, of, um, of Iraq, those Hanafi scholars, the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. And he mixes what he learned from Medina with what he learned in Iraq. And he comes and he's, يعني, he comes with a, um, with a formula which reconciles the two madaris. He brings the, the, the methodology of the Iraq of, 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 of Ahl al Iraq in fiqh, and he brings the methodology of Ahl Hadith, and he and he writes his book, the famous book uh, Al Risala uh, uh, in Usul al Fiqh, the first book written in Usul. Okay, how was this book uh, uh, authored? A scholar of hadith in, in Iraq called Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi. He goes to Imam Shafi'i, he says, look, Imam Shafi'i, you know the Arabic language. You know um, um, general principles and special specialist or specific principles. You know what is abrogated in, in the Quran. You know what is not abrogated in, in the Quran. Write us a book that will allow us to interpret these hadith that you have. And that is how Imam Shafi'i wrote the book, Al Risala. He wrote it when he was asked by another scholar in, in hadith called Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi. He said, Write this book for us. So then he ends up becoming very famous. He ends up becoming very famous, okay? He ends up becoming extremely famous and he writes this book and he then goes, he then leaves Iraq, okay? And he goes to Mecca. When he goes to Mecca, he meets, and he stays in Mecca for nine years. He goes to Mecca again, now leaving Iraq for a second time. He goes to Mecca, and he meets Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. He meets, Ahmed, he meets Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, benefits from Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was a scholar of hadith and fiqh. They call him Faqihul Muhaddithin wa Muhaddithul Fuqaha. He, they call him the scholar of fiqh for the muhaddiths 
and then for the muhaddiths he was and for the for the scholars of fiqh he was a muhaddith and imam imam ahmed said something about imam shafi'i he said ما عرفنا العام والخاص إلا بعد ما ورد علينا الشافعي. We didn't know what was specific in the Quran as to what was general, except for when Imam Shafi'i came to us. Why? Because Imam Shafi'i lived with those Arabs in that in the Badia for nine, ten years and learned fusha, so he was able to identify what the Quran, what the ayat meant. Okay. Then Imam Shafi'i goes to Egypt. Imam Shafi'i then goes to Egypt and he goes to a Medina known as Fustat. Fustat was Qahira. Qahira, uh, Cairo, started off as a little city known as Al Fustat. Al Fustat, okay? Um, and um, uh, uh, he, he went there and he went there and he said that I couldn't understand what they were saying. He said, I couldn't understand the Egyptians. And even to this day, when they go to Egypt, nobody understands what they're saying. Okay? When you go inside the car and you speak fusha to them, they say, Sadaqallahu al azim so He's speaking in the Quran. That's, that's the, the running joke that everyone knows. Okay? So then anyway, Imam Shafi'i, you know, again, you know, because of uh, fanaticism and things like that, um, Imam Shafi'i, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 he ends up, you know, there's a lot of problems, and he dies young. He dies in his fifties, but he left behind a great legacy. Okay, and um, he dies, uh, you know, at a young age in in, in Fustat, which uh, which is now Old Cairo, and his effects on the Ummah are are very far reaching. M most of the major explanations of the books of Hadith are by Shafi'i scholars. So if you look at, for example, Fath al-Bari, the great explanation of, of, of Sahih al-Bukhari is by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who is, who is, what do you call it, who is Shafi'i. When you look at the first scholar of hadith to write a book, when you study uh, Mustalah al-Hadith, hadith grading, the first scholar to categorize the hadith in a way which you're able to study is known as Ibn Salah. He was a Shafi'i. Imam uh, 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 Imam al nawi who, who wrote an explanation of a Sahih Muslim, he Shafi'i, and on and on and on. So he has a big legacy to to what do you call it to, uh, to, 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 to to that he left behind. And then later on, when Persia was Sunni, because it was Sunni for a thousand years up until five hundred years ago, okay, the Hanafis and the Shafi'is used to have a big ma'arik wars, in, in not not physical wars, back and forth. In, in Persia, that's something that you guys maybe can read. It's very and it's very fun reading to just know about the history of the different Muslims. So we'll leave it there, inshaAllah Taala, and jazakumullah uh, khair uh, for listening, inshaAllah Taala. Nakhtafi bihaad al-qadr wa sallallahu sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad.